Hey family, welcome to the official YouTube page of One. I'm excited that you're here. This message is getting ready to bless your life. I want you to stay connected to the incredible things that are happening in this movement. So don't forget to subscribe and turn on your notifications. And if you want to partner with us in some of the great things that we're doing all over the world, you can give as well. Now it's time to get into this word. I love you. God bless you. Let's stay connected. Yeah, so I'm excited. I'm always excited. I love these sessions. I will forever be a part of the delegation. I am probably one of the few uh, male parts of the delegation. So officially, uh, Pastor Sarah, I'm letting you know that I am the newest member, uh, the newest acknowledged member of your delegation. But, but I just love you so much. And we've been praying about this conference and praying about this experience. Uh, and today, I want to give you a tool that I believe is going to help you step into your future. I think that this tool will allow you to keep your future within reach, literally to keep it within reach, and will also empower you in every season to step into everything that God has for you. And so, so this morning is about giving you a tool. In fact, if it wasn't for me discovering and regularly employing this discipline, I don't know where I would be today. Uh, I'd be nowhere close to the things that I've accomplished in God, in life, in ministry, in business. Um, in fact, I don't even know if I'd be alive today if it wasn't for me understanding uh, this discipline and this tool that I'm going to talk to you about today. And this tool, I believe that every uh, destiny person, every person that's serious about destiny, every person that is committed to fulfilling everything that is on their life, I believe that this is a tool that we must employ. And so today I want to talk about the discipline of revisiting the altars, revisiting the altars, and, and we'll jump into that. I want to draw your attention to a passage of Scripture first that will pretty much become the backdrop. There are a lot of passages of scriptures. I don't know if I'm gonna get into all of them. I wanna get more into the teaching, then you can go and, and, and study the scriptures on your own at home. But there's one that I think, uh, one section of scripture that sets the foundation that we'll be dealing with today, and that's in Genesis chapter 12. And I'm gonna read the first three verses, and then I'll read verse seven through nine. So uh, here we go, Genesis 12. Uh, one through three, seven through nine, we'll pray, we'll dive into this. And so it says, now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And we jump down to verse 7. It says, Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And he, Abram, moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So Abram journeyed going on still forward to the south. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for this moment that we have to, to be with you, to share with you. I thank you for the precious delegation that we are connected to right now, that we're experiencing right now in this moment. And Father, I thank you that your word is a lamp into our feet and it's a light into our path. And God, I thank you, God, that you're going to minister your word in a way that blesses, enlightens your people. So God, as we start this day off, we consecrate our hearts, we consecrate our minds, we still ourselves, we're open to receive all that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. If you receive that prayer, just put it right there in the comments, amen, just right there, amen, I receive it, I receive it. So I want to talk again about the discipline of revisiting the altars. And I'll start with this thought. I'll start by saying it's, it's truly amazing to me how much your future is tied into how well and how often you revisit the altars that you were moved to make. Your future 
is tied into how well and how often you visit the altars that you were moved to build. And so let's talk about altars and why they're important. What is an altar? What are altars? Of course, as it relates to the Bible, the biblical altar had to do with you building something, you erecting something that, you know, involves stone and involves wood and fire and, and the sacrifice. But the significance and the symbolism of an altar is so much deeper. And so here are a few things that I want you to think about as it relates to altars. What are altars? The first thing that an altar is, is the altar is the memorializing of a unique moment between you and God. And so what that means is that you and God have a moment, and we'll talk about it, so much ground to cover, and it's really going to bless you. But you and God have a moment. God comes to you, or, or there's some connection or some encounter with God. You're touched by God, and you're touched in such a special and in such a unique way that you feel like in some way you've got to memorialize the moment. I think, you know, in, in biblical times, they would, they would get the altar. They would literally build something right there, something that would literally last forever. And it would be a, a sign of covenant that, that God had met them, and, and they built something there. And oftentimes, they would go back and revisit them. But it's a place of memorial. What it means for us in today's time is, you know, maybe a word came to you or maybe, you know, a dream came to you or God engaged you. Uh, it's probably been happening throughout this conference. You know, words have been spoken to you. Ideas have come to you. And you know that, the, that it's not just an ordinary thought, an or, ordinary word. You, you feel divinity on it. And for you, you might, it might be something that you just receive deep in your spirit. And then you write it down, right? So right now, your journal could be your, your container of altars. And if it isn't, it should be because there are going to be several moments throughout this conference where God engages you, God touches you, God says something to you, God promises you. And it's very important that you memorialize that moment because you're going to have to go back to it in the future, which leads me to the second thought about what an altar is. And as we, we're talking about altars, what are altars? Altars are beautiful for the moment. It's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing when, when God engages you and you have this unique experience and this unique moment and it's exciting and it's encouraging and it's edifying and it is wonderful. And when you, you experience, you feel like you could change the world. When you, you, you ever got that word where you feel like, man, I don't need no other words. I mean, you, you get that word that's so on point and so poignant to where you are, just so, so specific to, to where you feel like you are in life that you don't need any other word, right? It's beautiful in the moment, but I think that the greatest application to, to alter moments are future moments because the reality of it is there are going to be times where you are going to lose sight of what God said. And any time that you lose sight of what God says, it begins to mess with your momentum. And momentum is everything. We're going to talk about that. So these altar moments are beautiful moments for the moment, but their greatest application is for future moments because when you have an altar moment and when you revisit the altar, and again, I'm going to tell you how to do it. We're going to get into it. It's going to be awesome. But when you, when you have, when you revis revisit the altar, when you revisit altar moments, what happens is your future stares back at you when you look at it. So, so there's a connection between you memorializing the moments that, that are unique between you and God and your future. Because you can't get there unless you go back and you revisit them because when you look at them, it's almost like a mirror of your future and it projects back to you the things that God has said, the things that God has done, the things that God has promised. And it sets you up for everything that God has for me. Are you tracking with me? We're gonna, I'm going to teach today, and we're going to unpack this thing. If you're tracking with me, put it right there in the comments. Say, I'm tracking with you, PT. I'm tracking. I'm tracking with you, PT. And so when we talked about what altars are, we talked about how they are the place where you memorialize those unique moments between you and God, and their greatest application is beyond that moment, but for future moments when you go back and to revisit them. What do altars do? Let's talk about that. Alter moments sustain and regain momentum needed to walk into your future. Momentum is everything. I love, I love, I love, I love, I love 
words. And momentum, I've learned that momentum is everything. There, there's certain breakthroughs that you can't experience unless you have the right momentum, right? Momentum has to do with the managing of moments, right? And, and, and you get to the necessary, the needed, required momentum in order to step into destiny by how well you manage moments. And so alter moments allow you to sustain momentum. You ever, you, you, you ever walked away from a conference, You walked away from maybe a a service or you walked away from a meeting or you you walked away from a seminar, something, and you step out of that moment and you had learned something, you had experienced something, you had a touch from God. It was absolutely amazing. And and you had the strength, the velocity, you know, the the, whatever you need. You you had it in order to to, to run on. Kind of like what I mentioned earlier. You felt like you had everything that you needed to complete your task. But somewhere, somehow, you lost momentum. Somewhere, somehow, you're like, wait, what happened to me? You know, I I was on fire. I saw it so clearly. I had faith. I was ready to start the business. I was ready to make that phone call. I was ready to engage the investor. I was ready to start the ministry. I was ready to start the nonprofit. I saw no hindrance whatsoever to stepping into this thing. I had great momentum coming out of a moment, but somehow, someway, life slow my momentum down. The awesome thing about revisiting altars is it allows you to sustain momentum. You've got, I feel it, life is about a pace and life is about a rhythm and and we've got to keep moving and we've got to keep going and yes, there are times of rest, but even rest is in the rhythm. And, And so in order for me to maintain the momentum that I need to produce everything that God has called me to produce, to realize everything that God has placed out there for me to realize and to actualize, I must be a manager of momentum. And revisiting altars allows you to sustain momentum, and if you lose momentum, it allows you to gain momentum back. This is one of the things that that altar moments do. What altar moments also do is altar moments also renew your mind, right? it's, It's like... We can have an experience where we're touched and we're changed, and man, life will come at you. And the next thing you know, those things that were formerly motivating you somehow got lost somewhere. They got lost in the busyness. They got lost in your your, your challenge. Maybe it's a challenge with a kid or or a struggle in life of some sort, and and your, your momentum gets lost, and your mind, you forget what God said, all these sort of things. So you have to go back to revisit those altars because a renewing, a mind renewal takes place as you do. Are you tracking with me? And then another thing that altars do is altars bless you with the gift of memory. You know, one of the things that I I, I realized pretty relatively early in my walk with God is that God doesn't have to tell you a whole bunch of new things. We just have to manage and steward well the things that God has already said. The reality of it is, you, I'm sure, are hearing new things, but but some of you need to master what God has already said to you. you, You ever wonder why sometimes the Bible is so repetitive? You ever been there? You know, this thing says that, and then you go to another place, and it says the same thing, and the Lord God said this, and the Lord God said that, and you're like, wait, didn't I already read this in another book, in another chapter, in another verse? You know, is God like like slow, like, you know, does does God, you know, is this the remedial course or whatever? No, it's not that. It's just that that there's one thing to to hear a word for the first time. There's another thing to revisit that word so often that that word becomes reality. And that's what you have to do with God moments, and that's what you have to do with, with, with unique experiences with God. You ultimately have to one day be so one with that word that you become that word that there's no longer any distinction between you and that word. I feel that for somebody. And that's why this message is so important because we've been praying and we don't want you to leave out of here having these profound, impactful encounters with God and then fall short of of the fullness of that word. And so we have to learn how to revisit those altars. First of all, we have to make certain that we build the altar. I don't let, let me tell you something, I don't let one good word, one empowering word that comes to me Go un, without me writing it down. 
That, that is a waste. See, see some, the, the reality of his reason why it's important to build altars is that some have not embraced the reality that you have to memorialize the move of God. Because I can tell you right now, there's an enemy to your soul who will do everything in his power to uproot the words that God gives to you. So, so you have to know that there is a force in existence right now that the moment that you get a word that is related to your destiny, the moment that you get a word that is life-changing, there is a force in the earth right now literally whose mission and assignment is to go and pluck that word right back up from you to keep you from, from, from producing, to ultimately keep you stagnant and barren. And, I've barren. and I feel something for somebody right now, and I just want to decree right now, you will not be barren. I don't care if you believe that you are past your time. I hear the Lord saying you're going to be fruitful and you're going to, and you're going to multiply because that is what I've called you to do. God is getting ready to give you some tools. I feel the Holy Spirit. Some of you have experienced some altars. You're getting ready to go back to your altars and you're going to rediscover promises and things that God has said to you and it's going to recolor your universe and it's going to change your life. If that's your word, put it right there in the comments and say, that's me, PT. That's me, PT. I'm going back. I'm going to revisit the altars. Put it right there in the comments because the altar, it blesses you with the gift of memory. The gift of memory. Again, sometimes it's not God doing something new, it's you remembering what God said he was going to do. And then when you understand that God is not a man, that he should lie, and that, and that what he says is going to come to pass, that changes everything. I, I feel God saying, you're about to get your mind back. You're about to get your mind back. Your, your vision is coming back. I feel the Lord. There has been warfare over your altar experiences. There's been warfare over the things that God has said. And some of you stepped into this conference and, and you were a completely different person than you were when you first got the word. But I feel like God is getting ready to breathe on your life all over again. He's going to breathe. You were, you, were, you were set back because of a disappointment. You were set back because of a letdown. But I'm telling you, you're going back to the altar. Oh, I feel the Holy Spirit. And so what do altars do? As I mentioned, altars help you to manage momentum and they renew your mind and, and they also bless you with the gift of memory. And this is how they do it. And we've kind of touched on it, but I want to move through this. Altars allow you to remember what God did. They allow you to remember what God did, right? An altar is, is the place where God moved. He, he moved in a moment and he solidified his credibility with you. See, if you've been walking with God, even just for a little while, you have had at least one moment in your life where God solidified his credibility. That, that, that one experience, I feel this so strongly, that, that one experience that let you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is real. You feel me? And then later on in life, when we don't revisit that altar, later on in life, we begin to struggle and wonder if God is real and wonder if, if what happened was, was, was luck or, 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 or a figment of, of your imagination. But you got to remember how you felt in that altar moment. Are you tracking with me? And so altars, they remind you of what God did. Altars also allow you to see what God will do. Because typically, when you have an altar experience, and I'm gonna get into some text in a little bit, but, but when you have an altar experience, it oftentimes is more than God doing something, but, but, but as you are building that altar, celebrating what God did, God is also pointing to a future promise as well. And so, and so altars also allow you to see what God will do. He said something to you. He made you a promise. There are times if I'm in a church service or I'm somewhere and, and I hear a word from God and God is prophesying to me about my future, I stop right there. I receive that word into my spirit. And oftentimes I, I put an offering. Most of the time I, I put an offering there. One is because I'm connected to my money, to be honest with you, right? I'm, 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 me and my money have a great relationship with one another, praise God. You know what I mean? So I'm connected with that and I put seed in the ground. I put value 
in the ground. So I put faith and I put value in the ground and that creates an altar and I write it down somewhere because I just memorialize what God said. And so altars also allow you to see what God will do. And that's happening all throughout this conference. I know these prophetic words are coming to you and you're hearing them out of the speaker's mouth and there's certain things that are in your spirit and it's happening, it's happening. And then this is another thing that altars do that I think is really interesting. Altars also allow you to see yourself properly, to see you properly. Because, because at that altar moment, when you look at what God has done and when you look at what God is doing, it projects and communicates value. And it, and it shows you who you are. And seeing yourself is critical for so many reasons. First of all, your voice family is absolutely vital. Your, your authenticity, who you authentically are, is completely vital. And oftentimes, us being ourselves, we put that on hold because... We're ultimately questioning, are we worthy of it? Uh, do we have what it takes uh, to, to, to step into everything that God says? And sometimes we, we, we shrink or we, uh, we, we don't fully step into who we are because we, we call it, you know, we're learning, we're still trying to figure it out, uh, which is really uh, self-doubt disguised as learning. And, and whenever you don't see yourself right, and let me tell you something, you can only enter into life according to how you see yourself. Identity is everything, right? If you don't see yourself right, then you can't project and present yourself properly. And if you can't do that, then the world is robbed of the gift of you. The gift of you. You're a gift. You wouldn't be here if you weren't a gift. And so one of the things you got to do is you got to go back to that altar because not only do the altars allow you to remember what God has done and allow you to see what God will do, but those altar experiences, when you revisit them, they allow you to see yourself right in order for you to be authentic. Let me just take a moment. I'm just going to digress for a second and, and talk about authenticity. Authenticity is everything because the universe won't respond to a false version of you. The real version of you has authority in the earth, has authority in life, the real version of you. And so I have to be it, but, but it's risky to be authentic. Let's just keep it 100, right? To love yourself, to believe in who God says that you are, it's risky to put yourself out there. But you know what, here's the truth. There's power in taking that risk. I, this is for somebody. There's, there's power in loving yourself and believing in yourself enough to take the risk of stepping out there being fully and authentically who you are. But that's where the power is. That's where the grace is. That's where, that's where transformation takes place. Watch this. Because no one has ever seen a you before. And that's why you've heard it all the time. Comparison or trying to be like somebody else is the worst thing that you can do. Because what people need is the authentic version of you, the one that was created in the image of God that looks nothing like anything other than the brilliant thought that was in God's mind before he put you in your mother's womb. And so authenticity is important because you have to step out of other people's definition of you and start practicing being the you that the altar keeps telling you that you are. Let me, let me, let's just stop for a second there. I, I, I believe that God wants to, to, to break you out of other people's definition of who you are and, and cause you to, to take the risk and begin to, to be more authentic and start practicing, right? Start practicing being the person who the altar keeps telling you you are. Who does the word of God describe you as? In those altar moments where God says, this is who you are, what do you do with that? Do you allow the boxes that people try to put you in to make you shrink back and not take the risk of being yourself, which is not a risk at all, to be honest with you? It's only a risk in your mind. The reality of it is when you step into the authentic version of you, doors are going to begin to open unlike never before. You're going to begin to attract the things that are attracted to the authentic version of you. There are awesome things out there, opportunities, but those opportunities are waiting for the version of you that the altar communicates to you that you are 
And that's why you have to revisit the altar. Your future stares back at you, but also your truest identity stares back at you when you revisit those altars. Are you tracking with me? If you're tracking with me, put it right there in the comments. Put it right there in the comments. I've got to get back to the altar. I'm tracking with you, PT. And what I've learned is that the more that you revisit the altar and the more that as you visit the altar and you have a meeting with that person, you become more the reflection of that person. In other words, the more I go back, the more I revisit the altar. If you're ever wondering, and let me tell you something, if this pandemic season did not make you ask the question, who am I now, then you missed the main point of the, trend, of the pandemic. The pandemic, one of the things it's designed to do is it's designed to make you say, who am I now, Lord? How am I supposed to show up in a world that has changed? And who am I supposed to emerge as in this new world? This pandemic, one of the things concerning this pandemic, one of the things this pandemic is about is about the revealing of you. It's about identity. It's about you and I coming to a place where we finally once and for all acknowledge who we are and step boldly into it as this world is looking for leadership. Are you tracking with me? And so the more you visit the altar and the more you have a meeting with that person, the more you become and reflect that person. Just put it in the comments. I've got to start revisiting those altars, PT. And now, of course, we can't talk about building altars and revisiting them and stepping into our futures without looking at the perfect model. And that perfect model is Abraham. And that's where the text comes in. Abraham, let's just talk about Abraham just for a second. Abraham literally is the quintessential destiny fulfiller. I mean, I want to be like Abraham. Abraham starts his journey. Here's, here's how it goes. He starts his journey in Genesis 12, which is what we looked at. God told him to get out of his father's house into a land that I will show you. I'll bless you. Make your name great. We know Abraham moved. And then at the end of Abraham's life, you'll find this in Genesis 24. Study it when you get a chance. It says that Abraham was well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed him in every way. So he starts off not really knowing God, not really experiencing God, not really journeying with God, but, but somehow experiencing God in such a way that he came to the place of trusting God and he journeys with God and he has all of these experiences but the end of that thing is he dies an old man all the promises fulfilled and God had blessed him in every way I don't know about you but I want that type of blessing I want to be like Abraham right Abraham is straight up life goals and so we can't talk about building altars. We can't talk about revisiting altars. We can't talk about fulfilling destiny without looking at Abraham. And so what I want to do really quickly is I want us to look at the altars that Abraham built. And he built four altars technically, but he had five noteworthy altar experiences that I want us to talk about. And let me say right now, this is not just about Abraham. I believe that Abraham, as he's called the father of faith, and, and, and just about every major faith tradition traces their, their lineage back to Abraham. I believe that Abraham is the quintessential model for what it looks like to walk with God and actualize and to possess everything that God has promised. So this is not just about Abraham. We're going to look at these altars. These altars were experiences uh, that God had with Abraham. But I bet, I bet that if we look close enough in our own lives, some of us will have had similar experiences, and I want to help you identify them because we're going to be people that begin to revisit altars regularly so that we can have the momentum necessary to lay hold of everything that your life is designed to lay hold of. Are you tracking with me? And so I want to talk about these five altars, and I don't want to talk about them because they're different types of altars and I want to talk about not only the altars, but what they're designed to do in your life. Is that fair? Y'all ready? Let's do it. So let's talk about the first altar, altar number one. And altar number one is the altar of confirmation and specificity. It's the altar of confirmation and specificity. And we see this in Genesis 
chapter 12 and verse 6. Let's run over there real quick. Let's run over there real quick. So this is after God has engaged Abraham. He told Abraham, hey, you got to get out of your father's house to a land that I'm going to show you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great, and you are going to be a blessing. And then we know that Abraham moves, right? So God speaks to him. Abraham moves. God tells him that he's going to do something, and Abraham begins to move towards it, right? So when, when God sees that Abraham is obeying and begins to move towards it, it says in verse 7, then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, to your descendants, I will give this land. And there Abraham built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. So this first altar is an altar of confirmation. After God uh, spoke to Abraham and he moved, God showed up and gave him a specific promise. He says, this is the land I'm giving you. In essence, he fine-tunes the original promise, and Abraham builds an altar there. If you're taking notes, write this down. There will always be confirmation and clarity if you keep walking and if you follow the instruction. One of the things that I love about God is, is oftentimes we, we get into this kind of um, this stalemate with God, and, and God will give us a word, and and, and we will say, okay, I heard that word, but, uh, you know, if you show me, I'll do it, right? So, it, it, it's, so we don't move. We say, God, you said it, but I need you to show me something. And if you show me something, then I'll do it. And, and God says, instead, if you believe me, I'll show you. Or maybe it's better. We say, God, if you show me, I'll believe you. And God says in turn, no, if you believe me, I will show you. And so what happens is Abraham believes God, he steps out on it, and he gets a little down the road on the journey, and God appears to him right away, and he brings confirmation and clarity. That is the first altar. God will always bring confirmation and clarity if you walk with him, if you keep on walking, if you follow the instruction. That's the first altar. And this is an important altar because one of the things that we have to recognize and we have to continuously realize on our journey with God is that the future doesn't happen all at once. It doesn't happen all at once. So, there, so practically speaking, you might be in a situation right now where, where God has given you a promise and you, maybe you feel far away from the promise but maybe you need to go back and revisit the altar of confirmation, right? I don't believe that God does anything in our lives without first having confirmation somewhere. And maybe you have turned away from what you expected or, or maybe, you know, you, you've kind of pulled back because you have gotten too far away from the altar of confirmation and specificity, there's some under the sound of my voice, and you need to go back to that moment. Remember that moment where God appeared to you. God showed up. It says, notice, it says God appeared to him. God showed up and says, you're on the right track. I'm with you. In fact, it's going to look like this. I feel that for somebody. Somebody, you already have within you in the, in the depths and the recesses of your spirit all the truth that you need to take your life to the next dimension. It's already in there. But you have to go back and revisit those things. And I don't care how long ago it was or what it was about. It doesn't matter. These things are building blocks that establish you in your trust in God. And they produce the momentum necessary to keep moving. It, it, life, destiny unfolds. These are building blocks. And sometimes you got to go back to that place. And we're going to talk about going back to that place in, in just a second. But the first altar is the altar of confirmation and specificity. I want you to pause. And I want you to ponder. What are the altars of confirmation and specificity you've received over your journey? Where are they? And when was the last time you revisited them? Stagnation may have something to do with your failure to revisit those altars. Some of those altars are in your journal right now. Some of you probably have 20 journals at home that span over the last five years of your life. But here's the thing. When have you gone back and looked at them? Are you tracking with me? We got to move on. Altar number two. Altar number two is the altar of access and direction. And this altar is designed to give you 
assurance of the ongoing accessibility and the presence of God and the assurance of divine guidance. Now, let's go back to Genesis chapter 12, and we're going to look at verse 8 and 9. Are you tracking with you? You still tracking with me? Put it in the comments. I'm tracking with you, PT. I'm tracking with you, PT. I'm tracking with you. Okay. So, the second altar, the altar of access and death and direction, if we look at Genesis chapter 8, it says, excuse me, Genesis chapter 12, verse 8, it says, and he moved from there to the, to the mountain east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. We read this already. It says, there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So, and then after this, after this altar, it says, so Abraham journeyed going on still southward. So, so right there in that Genesis from, from, from uh, verse 7 to 9, Abraham builds two altars. The first altar, of course, is the altar of confirmation and specificity. This is when the Lord appeared to him and, and confirmed him, affirmed him, and gave him specificity about the land that he was given him. And then the second altar is an altar where the Lord doesn't appear to him. He walks a little further, and then he stopped right there. He's moved to stop. He's probably at a juncture in his life, at a crossroad in his life. He's moved to stop right there, and God does not appear unto him or does not engage him or initiate the encounter, Abram does. It says he, there in that place, he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. And then the next thing you know, he starts moving again and he journeyed going on still southward. This is the altar of access and direction. And, and this one is where God begins to develop you into a confident hearer of God. There's some under the sound of my voice right now and maybe right now you're questioning whether or not you've heard God's voice or you hear God's voice or you have access to God's voice. But I bet if you look back in your history, there was a moment where God spoke to you so clearly and gave you direction so clearly and beyond a shadow of a doubt, you knew it was God. And in that moment, you had confidence that, man, wow, I'm I actually hear from God. I'm a hearer of God. I have access to God for direction. Let me tell you something about my life personally. I don't ever question whether or not God will show me which way to go. I never question whether or not God will give me wisdom in a situation regardless of how challenging that situation may be because I have altars I have altars of encounters with God where I sought God at a juncture in my life and I prayed and I talked to God and, 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 and God spoke to me and God gave me direction and I memorialized that moment because I'm going to need to know in every season of my life that I have access to God and that no matter what, I can get direction. And this allows me to get out of the boat with boldness, because I know that if God calls me out of the boat, even if he doesn't give me all of the instructions, it does not matter, because what I have is him, and I have access to his voice, and so God doesn't have to give me all of the details. All God has to give me is himself, and so I believe that this is for somebody. If God has spoken to you, and he says, hey, start the business. Hey, call the attorney. Hey, do this. Hey, get on the phone. Don't wait to have it all figured out because it unfolds gradually. You couldn't handle the whole picture if you wanted to. If you, you couldn't handle the whole picture if God gave it to you. So you got to know, and I want you to look back over your life, and I want you to search the history of your altars, and I want you to find that place where God proved to you that you had access to him, you are a hearer of God's voice, and that God guided you because if he did it then, by golly, he'll do it again. The second altar is the altar of access and direction. The third altar, and I love this, this is the altar of awe and gratitude. It's the altar of awe and gratitude. And this one is designed to stir your wonder and to fortify your praise. It's designed to stir your wonder and fortify your praise. Let me just run over to something real quick. Genesis chapter 13 and verse 3. Now, this is interesting because you're going to see Abraham go back to an altar that he already had made, but he's going to go back with new perspective. Because remember, um, well, let, let's read it. Okay, so, so 
in Genesis, we're talking about the third altar, the altar of awe and gratitude. So we're going to go to Genesis chapter 13, um, and I'm going to read the first four verses, four verses real quick uh, because we've got to land the plane soon. It says, Then Abraham went up from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him to the south. Abraham was very rich in livestock and silver and in gold. And I'll tell you how he got rich in just a second. And he went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and I to the place of the altar which he had made there at first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. So this, this altar of awe and gratitude was actually Abraham revisiting an altar that he had made before. It was the last altar that he had made before, but he revisits it. The same altar with a different perspective because this altar was a full circle moment for him. And let me explain. So Abraham, in between him building this altar, him returning to this altar, he goes into Egypt with his wife, Sarah, and, and he basically lies and he's fearful, you know, and, and he basically offers up his wife, Sarah, to, to Pharaoh, to the, to the king over in Egypt, and, and, and he's basically in a pickle, in a predicament. God curses Pharaoh's house. You've got to read it when you get a chance. God curses Pharaoh's house. Pharaoh says, oh, okay, I better bless you, and he gives him all this stuff. He makes him rich, and he comes out of that, and when he comes out of that, all he can do is go back to that former altar and give God praise because now he sees just how committed God was to fulfilling his promise. He's moving in a direction. He had probably lost sight of the promise. Now he's trying to maneuver and hustle and, and trying to gain favor with Pharaoh and try not to kill himself. But all of a sudden, you know, even though he had messed up, God still blesses him, increases him. And this is now a full circle moment. And so there he goes back to that altar and he's got a new praise. He's got a new testimony. He's got a new sense of awe and wonder at God because God had done such a great thing for him. You ever had a full circle moment? You ever had God, God bring you into something that maybe you felt like you were unworthy of, or maybe it, it was a promise that took super long to come to pass, and the next thing you know, you looked up and you were standing in it. That's a full circle moment. That's altar number three. It's an altar of awe and gratitude. And then this fourth altar is my favorite altar. And this is the altar of the affirmation of transition, the affirmation in transition. And this one is designed to affirm you of God's love and support when you have to pivot for the sake of your destiny. Real quick, this is good. Let's go to Genesis 13, verses 14 through 18. Can I teach today? Is it okay? I want to teach. You got to get this. You got to get this. And so Genesis chapter 13 and 14, it says, And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, he says, lift up your eyes now and, and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward, for all the land which you see I give to you and your descendants forever, and I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. Then Abraham moved this tent and went and dwelt by the terebinth trees in Mamre, which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to the Lord. Here is what's happening. you got to study when you get a chance, but it is an amazing and wonderful thing. Abraham has to make the difficult decision to part ways with a critical, key, and vital relative. And, and, and when he does that, when he does that, God comes to him and affirms him. And see, you have to visit the, the altar of affirmation and transition often because oftentimes destiny will lead you to make awkward, uncomfortable, and sometimes painful pivots for the sake of destiny. And when that happens, you have to revisit that, alt that altar often because leaving the familiar will throw everything negative at you. Because you've got to remember, you're stepping out of a place that may not have been the best place, but it was a place of comfort. And it was a place of peace, and it was a place where you knew everything. I, I, there have been so many times in my, lives where, my life where I've had to step out of my comfort zone. I had to step out of the familiar. I had to break 
relationships and I had to break, you know, business situations and I had to break ministry alliances and all these sort of things and it was awkward and it was so uncomfortable and then the, the, the other guy comes and he makes you wonder, did you do the right thing? You know, did you make a mistake? And all these sort of things start happening to you but, but, but you cannot forget the moment where God established an altar and said, I'm with you. Abraham leaves Lot and the moment that he separates himself from Lot, the moment that he, that he moves into this time of transition, God comes to him and says, lift up your eyes now. I couldn't do it before because you were out of position. I couldn't do it before because you had the wrong alliances and allegiances and partnerships. And I know it was hard for you to do, but I called you to do it. You stepped out of that thing. You did that thing. You trusted my still small voice. Now I'm getting ready to bless your socks off. And he builds an altar right there. But oftentimes when you do it, there will be moments where you you will begin to question, did I make the right decision? And you have to go back to those moments where God showed up on your behalf and affirmed you and told you that even in this transition, I'm with you. That's somebody's word. If that's your word, put it right there in the comments. That's my word right there. That's my word. Go back to the place. If that's you, you're in a transition and there's a part of you that that wants to, to sneak and go back, right? If that's you, I need you to go back to that altar of affirmation in transition. Go, I feel that for somebody. You were getting ready to go back to something that was beneath you. Don't you go back. The word of God says, said anyone who puts their hand to the pile, looking back is not fit for the kingdom of heaven. Keep going. I'm cheering you on. This is another altar opportunity for you. Keep going because what God has for you is on the other side of you navigating in a fortified way the transition that you're in. The last altar Altar number five is the altar of infinite multiplication and legacy. This altar is designed to permanently establish you as God's friend and to empower you to walk in the assurance of blessings that outlive you. I'm going to tell you where this is and I'm going to tell you what happened. It's in Genesis chapter 22 and 9. This is when Abraham... And perhaps you had the realest moment ever with God, the realest moment ever with God. It's, it's that moment where you laid everything down. The context is Abraham being willing to sacrifice Isaac to obey God. It's the moment where you put nothing, I feel the Holy Spirit, you put nothing before God. Wow. I'm just thinking about it in my own life. There, there's this, this, this pivotal moment where, where you know within yourself that God knows that there's nothing between you and God. It is an honest, real moment. It's not the moment where the rich young ruler, when he's asked to let go of everything to serve God, walks away sad. No, no. It's the opposite of that. It's when God calls you to a high level of surrender and sacrifice, which is just a test. He just needs to know that you value him according to his worth. And look at what happens. So God lays down. So Abraham says, I won't keep anything from you, even the thing that I desired the most. I won't keep that from you. And then Abraham says, oh, I'm about to bless your socks off. You've got to study it when you get a chance. It's in Genesis chapter 22. And he basically says, I'm going to read just a little, just a little piece of it, and then we're going to pray and we're going to close out. In verse 15, it says, because that happened, he says, the angel of the Lord called Abraham and he said, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore and your descendants shall Possess the gates of their enemies, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. This is the altar of infinite multiplication and legacy. Family, we can go on and on. This is literally a series if I had the time. But I want to give you this tip and this tool and this discipline that I believe is going to bless your life. Family, you have altars. You have altars. You have many altars. This is not just, of course, we only saw four or five instances, but in order for Abraham to get to where he got, Abraham had many altars. 
And if he didn't have many altars, he at least had many visits to former altars. Because that is what it's going to take. As I prayed for you, that is what it's going to take for you to fully walk in the power and the momentum that is required for you to realize your destiny. And so over these next, you know, over today and over yesterday, I believe that you had experiences that are worthy of memorializing. And my prayer to you is that you will do that. I want you to go back and I want you to look at some of those things that God spoke to you. I want you to memorialize. If you haven't memorialized those moments, I want you to. I want you to to go back to those moments where God did something for you. Look at them afresh. Stare at them afresh. Because when you do, your future is going to look back at you. Father, thank you for your daughters. Thank you for all those who are watching. Lord, I pray that you would instill this discipline of revisiting the altars in them. Lord, you're giving them moments where they're going to establish new altars today. So that they're going to walk away from this conference when it's all said and done. Not just having a good emotional experience and then going back to normal. No, God, you're going to equip them with the powerful tool of memory. So that they will be able to, in any moment, in any season, look at their circumstance. Look at their situation. And remember who you are, what you've done, what you're going to do and who they are. Bless these, your daughters. I thank you that you're going to make them fruitful and multiply. I thank you that they're daughters, not just of destiny, but of legacy. In Jesus' name, amen.